Well, before we leave the pastoral epistles and move on uh, to, uh, to Philemon, there's one more message I, I feel like I need to speak to you from, from the pastoral epistles, and it's uh, one that I've had on my heart for a while as I've studied through these three books of First and Second Timothy and Titus. You know, sometimes when I hear about a, a church and I want to know, I want to know what their doctrines are, what do they believe, and what do they teach? And sometimes you can't tell by the name of the church because the modern thing is take the denomination out of the name uh, and uh, substitute something more generic so people don't really know if you have doctrines, if you ha what they are, it seems like. They, they kind of want to hide that, don't want people to find it out. Even if you go to the church's website, it's hard to de determine what they believe and teach because uh, a lot of churches don't publish doctrinal statements anymore. Uh, some of them have replaced them with something they call core values, which is basically we believe you ought to love God and treat each other right. And that's kind of their core values, and it gets a little more detailed sometimes. But, you know, who can't disagree with that or who can't, who can't agree with that? There's a writer named Ron Merriman who said that doctrine has become the dreaded D word. Some see it as divisive, as though truth and error admit to little difference. Others see doctrine as dry and boring, as though God's truth is unrelated to human experience. Still others avoid doctrine like the plague, fearful that it minimizes love, as though love can be sentimentally divorced from the truth. Charles Swindoll, who's one of my favorite writers, says that many churches today focus more on the form of their worship, music styles and lighting and building designs than they do on the content of the faith that they mean to proclaim. And while the form of a church's worship is vital to reaching its community for Christ, without a firm base of sound doctrine, the church will lay its foundation in shifting and sinking sand. And I think that is very true. The words doctrine and doctrines appear in the Scripture 56 times. And 16 of those times are in these three little books that we call the pastoral epistles, First and Second Timothy and Titus. And uh, so I'll, I, it'd be a good uh, study for you to go home, and if you have a concordance or you've got a search engine, a Bible search engine, to type in that word doctrine and doctrines and read all those verses where it mentions doctrine and doctrines, it would be a, it'd be a good lesson for you to study. But I want to read a few of those verses today uh, in 1 Timothy and in 2 Timothy. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, we uh, start with verses 1 and 2. It says, Now the Spirit, and that is the Holy Spirit, speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. If we drop down to verse 13, this veteran preacher Paul says to the young preacher Timothy, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. Verse 16 says, Take heed to thyself and unto thy doctrine. Pay attention to it, he says. and Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. And then I want to read one passage in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 4. And this is a, a kind of a prophecy and a warning, 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 3, he says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and they shall be turned unto fables. So you can see that in these books that are written from an older, past, older preacher to a younger pastor, and trying to tell him, how to be a good pastor to the church where he was, that, that Paul thought, and God, by speaking through Paul, thought that doctrine is indeed important. So the message today is doctrines sound and unsound. One of those verses that I read talked about 
sound doctrine. And I want to do a, a contrast today of the difference between sound doctrine and unsound doctrine. First of all, we start with the meaning. The word doctrine, it just means teaching or that which is taught. Now, I've heard people say, oh, I don't believe in doctrine. I've heard people say, my church doesn't teach doctrine. I've heard pastors say, I don't, I don't focus on doctrine. And if they say that, and they mean it, what they're really saying is, we don't teach anything at our church. Because doctrine means teaching. And, you know, and, that, and I think from, I don't get around to a lot of churches. I watch some stuff on YouTube and on the Internet. And, and I guess that is accurate because from what I can tell, some churches don't preach really and teach anything. They just kind of have a big show on Sunday. And they've got a band and music, and it's more like going to a concert than going to church. And I understand their efforts and their desire to try to reach a younger generation and like that. But, uh, but as we uh, point out in the Scripture, doctrine is important. Doctrine means teaching. So if you're not... If you don't focus on doctrine, you're not really teaching anything. And, you know, and uh, the role of a pastor is it's, it's kind of a combination title. And there in Ephesians chapter 4 where he says that God is called, God calls some apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers. That really is kind of a hyphenated term. Pastor, teacher is the same thing. And as, as preachers, we are supposed to teach and preach the Word of God. It talks about sound doctrine. That word sound, where in sound doctrine, it's where we get our word hygiene. And I think we all believe in hygiene, don't we? And we wish everybody else did. Hygiene just means being physically clean and physically fit. Uh, sound doctrine, then, is wholesome and healthy. It's true and it's accurate. In 1 Timothy 1.5 it describes uh, sound doctrine as unfeigned faith, as real faith, genuine faith. To contrast that, unsound doctrine then has to be the opposite of sound doctrine. So unsound doctrine is harmful and unhealthy and untrue and inaccurate. It's false doctrine. First, uh, uh, Second Timothy 1, or 1 Timothy 1, 4 uses the term fables. To describe uh, unsound doctrine. So that's what, when we talk about sound doctrine and unsound doctrine, that's the difference that, in the meaning. Uh, sound doctrine and unsound doctrine come from a different source. Where does sound doctrine come from? It comes from the Bible. Uh, we quote 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 and a lot. And it's one of those verses in 1 Timothy that has the word doctrine in it. It says they're all scriptures given by inspiration of God uh, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, which means mature, grown up, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So sound doctrine comes from the Bible. Sound doctrine comes from the Holy Spirit. When Jesus was preparing his disciples for the time that he was going to go away, uh, he was trying to comfort them. He said, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient or necessary for you that I go away. He said, for if I don't go away, the comforter will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will reprove. That means convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. John 16, 13, Jesus said, how be it? When He, the Spirit of truth, is come, He will guide you into all truth. So uh, the Holy Spirit guides us into all truth. The Holy Spirit is a great teacher. Human teachers, in case you don't know, are fallible. When I first became a Christian, especially when I first became a preacher and started buying uh, books about the Bible and commentaries and that kind of thing, uh, I thought, if it's written in a commentary, it must be true. Kind of like some people are with the Internet. If you read it on the Internet, it's got to be true. But I came to realize after a while, but this commentator says this verse means this, and this one says it means this, and this one says it means something else. So they can't all be true, can they? 
So I began to realize that uh, commentators, even pastors and teach, Bible teachers, uh, they are not infallible. I am not infallible. You know that, don't you? Uh, and that's why I encourage you, don't believe something just because I say it. But you search the Scriptures, and that's one reason I quote Scripture so much, is because what I think is not really that important. Opinions are not that important. Everybody has an opinion. But what's really important is what God says, and what the Bible says, and what the Holy Spirit says. We humans, though we study and we try our best, we make mistakes. I know that. For one reason I know it, because I have held a position on a certain thing, and I've studied more, and I've changed my mind about it. And anybody who is a serious student of the Bible has done the same thing. We are fallible, but the Holy Spirit is not fallible, and the Bible, the Word of God, is not fallible. So uh, sound doctrine comes from the Bible, and it comes from the Holy Spirit. Unsound doctrine comes from the opinions of men, which are not necessarily from God. In Matthew chapter 15, Jesus was writing to the Pharisees, speaking to the Pharisees, and he said to them, You hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draw near to me with their mouths, and they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, but in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Now, you know, the Bible is, doesn't speak to every issue. Uh, so we have, to, uh, inter we have to interject some opinion and, and, uh, and some ideas in some areas, but where the Bible speaks, we are not at liberty to contradict that or to change that, which is what what, uh, which is what produces unsound doctrine. When we take the Word of God and we say, I don't like that teaching, I don't agree with that teaching, that contradicts the way I want to do and the way I want to live, so I'll just believe something different, I'll change it, and I'll teach something different. Well, that's where unsound doctrine comes from. It comes from the opinions of men as opposed to the Word of God. Unsound doctrine, he says, actually comes from the devil, 1 Timothy 4.1 he talks about the doctrines. Uh, he talks about seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And there he's not talking about doctrines of what we believe about Satan and the demons and like that. But he's talking about doctrines, teachings, beliefs that are uh, taught and promoted and encouraged by the devil and his helpers. Uh, they come, false doctrine has its source from the devil. Uh, unsound doctrine comes out of ignorance passage in uh, 1 Timothy 6 says, If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words or sound words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud knowing nothing. And that word knowing nothing is the word for ignorance. We are, you know, I used to think that to ignorance, uh, to call ignorance is an is a insult but it's a reality. Aren't we all ignorant? If you don't know everything about everything, then you're ignorant about some things, right? Well, he says false doctrine comes from ignorance. The Bible is the source and the foundation of sound doctrine. And in the Bible, God tells us everything we really need to know. He doesn't tell us everything we want to know. He tells us everything we need to know. And if we ignore the Bible we will be ignorant of sound doctrine. Uh, unsound doctrine comes from pride. Again, there in 1 Timothy chapter 6, he says, talks about those who teach unsound doctrine, and he said that person is proud. Well, how do pride and false doctrine go together? Well, see, if a person is proud, then he can read a scripture and he says, he can say, his pride will make him say, well, God said that and the Bible says that, but I don't agree with that. And in that pride to say, uh, I don't believe something God said. And it's pride that says, I'm smarter than the Bible is, just because the Bible says it doesn't mean it's so. And so uh, that 
that pride makes a person ignore or overlook or even contradict the sound doctrine of the Scriptures. Um, there are a lot of false churches, untrue churches, unfaithful churches, and denominations, and even religions that have come about because somebody read what it said in the Word of God, and that did not match up with their lifestyle and the way they were living and the way they wanted to live. And rather than adjust their lifestyle, and the way, rather than adjust their living to what the Bible says, uh, they invented, established a new doctrine, a new interpretation, a new religion that would justify and approve of and promote even and encourage the way they wanted to live. Um, so that's the sound doctrine and unsound doctrine differ in their source. Sound doctrine comes from the Bible. It comes from the Holy Spirit. Unsound doctrine can come from any number of sources. There's also a contrast in the result. Uh, some people seem to think that there is no connection. And actually, in, you know, in a lot of people's lives, there is no connection between doctrine and life, between what people believe and, what, and the way they live. But in reality, what you really believe shows in the way you live. Uh, the way you live is really the true reflection of what you believe deep in your heart. Uh, what's the result of sound doctrine? Sound doctrine can lead to salvation. Paul told Timothy, uh, from a child you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Jesus Christ. Now I want to make this clear. We are not saved by believing doctrines. I can hand you the Baptist doctrinal statement, the doctrinal statement of our church, and you can check it off and say, I believe all that, and still you could be lost and go to hell. You're not saved by believing a set of doctrines. But there are doctrines and teachings that you must believe in order to be saved. You must believe, and before you can be saved, you've got to believe what the Bible says, that you're a sinner. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Because if I'm not a sinner, I don't need to be saved, and I don't need to be forgiven, right? To be saved, you must believe that Jesus is the virgin-born Son of God, and that He died on the cross as a sacrifice for your sins because he said I am the way and the truth and the life and no man can come to the Father but by me. So unless you believe in the biblical Jesus then, then he can't save you. You must believe that salvation is by grace through faith and not as a product of works or a product of baptism or a product of church membership because if we try to depend on these other things and we do not totally put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus and Him alone, then the Scripture teaches us that there is no salvation outside of Jesus. There's no other name under heaven where we must be saved other than through Jesus, Acts 4, 12. So uh, salvation can, produce, can, can lead to, uh, sound doctrine can lead to salvation. Sound doctrine builds up believers and the church. In 1 Timothy 4, 6, he says, If thou put brethren in remembrance of these things, that is, these sound teachings, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished or built up in the words of faith and of good doctrine whereunto thou hast attained. Uh, sound doctrine is like healthy food. It helps you grow. It helps make you stronger. Sound doctrine produces godliness. 1 Timothy 6, 3, he talks about the doctrine that is according to godliness. Titus 1 and verse 1, Paul, a servant of God, the apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and the acknowledgement of the truth which is after godliness. He said the truth or sound doctrine produces godliness. Sound doctrine produces unity. Now, you know, a lot of people are about unity and, and they misunderstand and they think that if we sacrifice doctrinal purity, then that can lead to unity. But 
Amos asked the question, can two walk together unless they be agreed? God is not the author of confusion. You know, and if you had a elementary, if we had a, a second grade Sunday school teacher that teaches people, well, you're saved by faith in Jesus Christ, and then they promote to third grade, and you've got a third grade teacher here in our church teaching kids that, oh, uh, salvation comes by baptism, then the kid's going to scratch his head and say, that's not what my other teacher taught me. And they're not going to know what to believe. So uh, sound doctrine leads to unity and not confusion. On the other hand, unsound doctrine produces godlessness. Bad doctrine produces bad behavior. And as I mentioned, a man's behavior reveals what he really, really believes deep down inside. 2 Timothy 3, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Could we maybe be living in that time? Are we living in perilous times? It looks so to me. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those things which are good, traitors, heavy, or heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than God. Well, that looks like society today. But then the next verse says, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. There's a form of godliness. In 2 Timothy 2.17, Paul compared false doctrine to a form of gangrene or cancer uh, that spreads quickly and contaminates the other parts of the body that it infects, that it touches. 1 Timothy 6, 4, and 5 say, again says, He is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions of, and strife of words, whereof cometh envy and strife and railings and evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is, a, is godliness. There are several things he points out here are the product of unsound doctrine, one of those is strifes, which is disputes, fightings, arguments. Envy is another. Railings, speaking evil of the people. Suspicions and greed, supposing that gain is godliness. Let me tell you something. There is money to be made in false religion today. And if you don't believe it, turn your television on for a few minutes even on some of the religious channels and listen to some of those lies that some of these guys are pouring out and look them up on the internet and look at their net worth. Uh, there's a lot of rich, a lot of uh, preachers that have a lot of money who are teaching unsound doctrine, which is totally contrary to the Word of God. There's money to be made in it. And, and that's one reason they teach this false doctrine is out of greed and, and gain for themselves. Fault, uh, unsound doctrine leads to deception. He says, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived, 2 Timothy 3.13. It leads to vain worship. I've quoted Matthew 15.9 earlier, but in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines, the commandments of men. Jesus said, God is spirit, and they that worship me must worship me in spirit and in truth. And truth is sound doctrine. God says, if you want to worship me, you've got to, your worship has to be based on truth. And it has to come from your spirit, not just from actions of the flesh. Unsound doctrine produces division. Teachers teaching different things that leads to people to be confused and divided. Well, what should be our response to this sound doctrine and unsound doctrine? 1 Timothy 4.13 says that we should give attention to it, pay attention to it, take heed to it. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. He says in 2 Timothy 
2.15, you'll want the kids to know that, right? Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. He says that we need to pay attention, give attention to doctrine. We should hold fast to sound doctrine. 2 Timothy 1.13, hold fast to the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love and in Jesus Christ. And that good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Spirit which dwelleth in us. What's he talking about? Paul said, Timothy, I have taught you sound doctrine. Where did Paul get his sound doctrine? He got it from the Scriptures and he got it from the Lord because he was inspired of God when he wrote these words. 2 Timothy 3.14, Continue thou in the things which you have learned and been assured of and knowing of whom you have learned them. You know, when I was growing up, people had a, what we might call a, a denominational loyalty. And if you, were, uh, if you were raised a Baptist, you pretty much, and you went to church, that's where you went. But our, this generation is different. When they choose a church, they don't always go by what they were taught and what they believe is true. You know, I meet people and they say, oh yeah, I used to be a Baptist, but not anymore. Why not? Well, I like the music they have with this other church. Well, I like good music too. But are you going to sacrifice the truth because you like the music? Or they say, oh, we got, they got this young preacher over there and he's, he dresses real sharp and he, man, he's really with it. And Well, are you going to, uh, is that the right way to choose which church you go to? Whether you like the preacher, whether you've got friends who go there. and So what if they don't teach really what the Scripture says? I don't think that's the right way to evaluate things. And I don't think the Bible teaches that's the way to evaluate things. He told, Paul told Timothy, continue in the things that you were taught. Continue to hold forth sound doctrine. And Jude, uh, verse 3 of that book, he says that we should earnestly contend for the faith. And that didn't mean, doesn't mean we should go out wanting to debate and argue and pick fights with people that disagree with us. But it means we should not compromise the truth just because it becomes unpopular. Paul teaches us, and the Bible says that we should preach and teach sound doctrine. 1 Timothy 2 7, whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ, and I lie not. I'm a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. Verity means truth. 2 Timothy 2 2, and the things which thou hast learned of, have heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. See, we're in a relay race. And this generation passes, is, is, has a responsibility to pass the truth on to the next generation so they can pass it on to the next generation. I ran track one year, ran a relay in a relay team, and uh, probably the most critical part in a relay race is when you pass off the baton, Right? Because if you don't have a smooth transition of one fellow passing the baton to his teammate, you either get out of, out of step and you lose time or you drop it and you got to stop and pick it up and you can, it, it really can make the difference in winning or losing. And so it's our responsibility to pass the baton of truth and sound doctrine on to the next generation. He says we are to adorn Sound doctrine, uh, second, uh, Titus 2.10, not purloining, but showing thyself uh, all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. The word adorn, it, it's got the idea of jewelry. And the idea is don't be ashamed of your doctrine. Don't be ashamed of the truth, but wear it like a necklace or wear it like an engagement ring or a wedding ring or a diamond ring. Don't try to hide it. Display it, put it out there because it's a beautiful thing and not something to be ashamed of. He says, and, and, and well, I'll, he says that we should honor and support pastors who teach and preach sound doctrine. And I don't mean at all to sound self serving here, and I certainly hope you don't take it that way. But you know, the day is coming. 
if Jesus doesn't come back and take us all away together, I'm going to be too old to be your pastor anymore. And you're going to have to find somebody else to do it. And I hope you'll keep this in mind. He said, let the elders, that is the pastors that, that rule well, be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in word and doctrine. For the scripture says, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. When he talks about double honor here, he's talking about showing respect. But really what he's talking about is he says, let the pastors who are faithful to teach you sound truth and sound doctrine, he says, you pay them double. He says that, you know, sometimes it's the flashy preachers that play fast and loose with the truth that make the most money and that get the most attention. But that ought not to be the case. He says that you need pastors and teachers who teach you and preach to you the truth. And you ought to show honor and respect to them. And I appreciate the fact that y'all do support me financially and you do respect me and show that to me. I appreciate that very much. He's, but unsound doctrine, what should we do about unsound doctrine? Teachers of unsound doctrine should be rebuked. I've often thought, I've never had to do it, but I've, I've often thought, what would I do if we have a visiting speaker and he gets in this pulpit and he says something that is blatantly false doctrine? Well, that'd be a hard spot to be in, wouldn't it? And I don't, I've tried to think it through and I don't know what I would do. I don't know if I would just jump right up and say, that's enough, you get out of here. Or if I would wait till he's finished and get up and say, folks, this thing that he said, it's not true. I know I would have to do something. Uh, there are some, uh, sometimes people want to be teaching. Doctrine is in error. And we do not allow them to teach in our church if that is the case. And I don't mean to offend anybody or limit anybody from uh, doing something they want to do. But we have to guard and protect the truth. Uh, teachers of sound doctrine should be rejected as teachers he says in Titus 3.10, a man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition reject. And he says, he says in Galatians chapter 1, they were having problems in the church at Galatia because after Paul left, there were false teachers coming in and teaching a, a different gospel than what he taught. And he said there, I'm, he said, I marvel that you're so far removed from the gospel that I preached to you. And he said, if an angel from heaven or any other person, any other human comes and he teaches to you, he preaches to you a different gospel than I have preached to you. Let him be accursed. That's pretty strong language, isn't it? Um, so in conclusion, let me uh, quote Charles Swindoll again. He said, make doctrine a priority in your life as well as encouraging it in your churches. Nothing is more significant than a solid foundation in Christ Nothing is more motivational than grace to live, our, live a life of good deeds. This generation, and I sound, boy, I sound, when I say that, I sound like an old fogey. I guess I am. The old part anyway, and probably a fogey in some ways. But, you know, uh, society as a whole, uh, the Christian faith as a whole, I'm afraid in our time, is downplaying sound doctrine. Uh, doesn't think it's important. Even, as I said in the introduction, think it's a bad word. Doctrine, oh, that's ugly. Don't bring that up. That divides people. If we tell people what we believe, some people won't come because they don't believe that. You know, and I want to have as many people in our church as we can, and I certainly don't want to turn anybody away. But I don't feel like we should do that. We should compromise. We should do, uh, attract more people or risk or try not to offend more people, if that's the right way to say it, by compromising the truth of God's Word. We didn't write God's Word, and so we can't change it. And uh, we have a responsibility to teach, to believe, and to teach, and to practice and to hold up the truth. Because, you know, uh, a diet of unsound doctrine may taste better 
but it's not as good for you. Instead of helping you, it can hurt you. I appreciate the fact that we have our, our leaders and our people who have a commitment to the truth of God's Word. And for, uh, what, 70, almost 80 years, this church has been committed to the truth of God's Word. And I pray that uh, you and I will help it continue to do so. Doctrine is not a dirty word. It's an important word in the Scripture. And I hope it would be important to you. Stephen, come, let's uh, sing our closing hymn. You stand with me if you would, please. And if God has put on your heart something that you need to do today, I pray you'll, you'll make that move, make that commitment.